So as you can see, we will speak about the lower limbs, starting with the muscles. <clears throat> and then next time we will continue with the vessels and nerves. And I will also give some clinical aspects to this topic. And I'd like to start with, with this table where you can see the muscle groups. And uh, I want to emphasize it that uh, you should know the muscle groups uh, because it will help you to learn the arteries and the corresponding nerves. Because if you follow this uh, table, you can see that for each muscle group, we have an artery and, and a nerve. Uh, but today we will concentrate on, on these muscle groups and the next slide show these groups a little bit in, in details. Uh, and uh, you always have to know where uh, a muscle group is located and which joint or which joints are moved uh, by these muscle groups. And in the lower limb, we can distinguish at first the so-called hip muscles, which are partly on the ventral side. These, um, so most of the so-called internal hip muscles are located ventrally. Uh, and uh, dorsally, we have the external uh, hip muscles. These are actually the gluteal muscles. And if we fold them up, we will see the deep group underneath. And the hip muscles act on the hip joint. And if we continue it downward uh, on the thigh, we have altogether three muscle groups. Ventrally, we have the extensors. I will change my uh, pointer here. Yes, so the extensors are in the front, and that's an important um, um, difference between the upper and the lower limb. That uh, on the lower limb we have the extensor groups, extensor group on the ventral side. Uh, medially, we have the adductors, and dorsally. Uh, we have the flexors. And as you can see, the adductors act um, only, almost only on the hip joint. So the uh, thigh will, be, um, will come closer to the trunk. Uh, and the extensors and the flexors act mainly on the knee joint. On the leg, we have also three muscle groups, extensors, uh, ventrally uh, flexors on the dorsal side, and we have uh, one more group, the fibularis or peroneal group. This is on the lateral side. And these muscles act mainly on the foot, that means uh, the ankle joint and talo-tarsal joints, and maybe on the uh, joints, of, uh, joints of the toes. And on the foot, we have uh, plantar muscles and, uh, door and some uh, dorsal muscles as well. Uh, we will start with the hip muscles. And as I mentioned, the hip muscles can be, uh, uh, so we can distinguish uh, internal, external, and deep hip muscles. And in this picture, you can see now uh, the one of the most important hip muscles, the iliopsoas muscles. Uh, this is a so-called internal muscle because it originates on the inner surface of the hip bone. Uh, I won't speak now in details about origin and insertion, but I want to emphasize is that uh, you have to know it for each muscle, the origin and the insertion, because only then you will be able to um, speak about the movements. And uh, if and regarding the movements, you always have to consider which joint is moved by the muscle. In this case, for example, the hip joint. And if you know the joint, then uh, as the next step, you have to uh, consider the type of the joint, so which um, movements are actually possible in this joint. And um, then where the muscle is located regarding the axis of the different movements. So for example, the iliopsoas muscle is uh, located on the ventral side, so ventrally from the uh, transverse axis. And if you remember the hip joint around the transverse axis, we can do the flexion and the extension movement. So muscles which are in front of the uh, axis will 
bend the hip. And the muscle uh, can also uh, carry out a lateral rotation. Uh, you can see here also the longitudinal axis around which we can do the rotation movements. And if you follow the muscle fibers, they run from the medial side to the lateral side and behind this axis. That's why they will uh, carry out the lateral rotation. And the next point you have to consider is uh, which of the attachments is the fixed and which the mobile point. Because in case of this muscle, for example, if uh, you lift your leg, it means that the mobile point is the insertion. But if you bend forward, this is actually the same movement carried out by the same muscle. But in this uh, case, the mobile point will be the origin. Uh, clinically, we can mention the so-called psoas abscess if uh, we have a collection of pus between the muscle and its uh, fascia. And um, for, uh, so it, this uh, condition uh, is that's why important because it can be uh, mixed up with herniations because as you can see in the photo, the um, abscess can exit uh, through the subinguinal hiatus and then uh, we have the protrusion on the thigh where also the protrusions of herniations are visible but in the next picture I will uh, show it so uh, it's also an important topic for the exam the subinguinal hiatus and its parts uh, laterally we have this lacuna musculo nervosa where the iliopsoas muscle exists and um, then medially to it lacuna vasorum and the most medial uh, part is the lacuna lymphatica and here is a region where herniations can occur, the so-called femoral herniation. Um, so the inlet of this uh, uh, femoral canal corresponds to the lacuna lymphatica and abdominal uh, viscera so gut loops can be protruded through this uh, opening because it's a that's a weak area and the femoral canal so that is uh, the canal where we have the hernia um, extends as far as the saphenous opening so this hernia can be mixed up, for example, with this abscess I mentioned before. And we have another type of hernia. Uh, and in this case, the uh, gut loops follow the inguinal canal. Um, so I want to emphasize that we uh, have the inguinal canal above the inguinal ligament. So please do not mix it up with the subinguinal hiatus. And in this semester, you have to know the borders of the inguinal canal, but the different types of the herniations we won't ask in the exam. You only have to know the fact that here also uh, can occur hernia, the so-called inguinal hernia. But let's go further with the muscles. Yes, the next uh, large muscle is the gluteus maximus. But this is already an external hip muscle because uh, it is uh, found on the external surface of the hip bone. And this is actually an antagonist of the iliopsoas. Uh, this is the strongest extensor muscle of the hip joint. And um, it can also cause lateral rotation if you consider the course of the muscle. Uh, and um, this muscle is mainly active if we, for example, uh, stand up for, from a sitting position or if we climb up stairs. Uh, but later you will see that we have other muscles which can also extend the hip. But um, this muscle is mainly involved in, in these movements. Uh, and but I also want to emphasize that um, we have lots of borsae. Uh, these are these um, structures which can reduce the friction and these are located between muscles and protrusions of bones, for example, between the uh, greater trochanter and the muscle or between the 
this cat tuberosity and the muscle and uh, bursitis is the inflammation of this um, bursae which uh, can occur after overuse of, of muscles. You can see here two examples for these conditions. And uh, if you fold up the gluteus maximus muscle, we have two more gluteus muscles called medius and minimus. Um, these are smaller and they, these are located a little bit more laterally. So the main function will be the abduction and um, be together with the media rotation. Yeah, I, all, I have now again assigned the axis of this uh, movement. If you remember in the hip joint is the up and adduction around the, around the sagittal axis. And these muscles are located laterally to this axis. So that's why they will do the abduction movement mainly. And uh, here, uh, I want to emphasize another um, movement, and this is uh, that uh, the fact that these muscles, um, so with the aid of these muscles, we can keep the pelvis in a straight position. So that means if you, for example, lift your right leg, the muscle of the contralateral side gets contracted. And this is the so-called isometric contraction. So that means the muscle won't uh, shorten. But with this isometric contraction, the uh, pelvis can be kept uh, in a straight position. And this is very important. This is a very important mechanism uh, during walking. Clinically, the gluteus medius muscle is important for uh, intramuscular injections. You can see how to find the right place uh, for these injections. Um, and we give the injection um, in this muscle because it doesn't contain so many vessels uh, like the gluteus maximus. And um, as you can see here, um, the, uh, the thick nerve called sciatic nerve is located more medially, so this uh, can be also uh, taken in consideration um, that uh, so the nerve doesn't, uh, so we, we won't uh, damage the nerve uh, if we give the injection in the gluteus, max, uh, gluteus medius muscle. Uh, in this slide, you can see the so-called uh, congenital dislocation of the femoral head uh, on the right side. Um, and I'm showing this slide to um, emphasize again this um, uh, important function of gluteus medius keeping the pelvis uh, in a straight position, because if you have uh, this condition, uh, in this case, as you can see, the femoral head is shifted upwards, so the acetabulum is empty. And uh, if you have this condition, the gluteus medius cannot be, uh, so cannot contract optimally, so the origin and the insertion will uh, get uh, closer to each other. And in this, so these patients uh, cannot walk uh, normally, so if uh, they lift the, 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 le the left leg on the contralateral side, the muscle cannot be contracted. So they have to uh, compensate uh, it with the trunk so that they can keep the balance. And if both sides are affected, then we have the so-called welling gait. And, uh, that, so to prevent this condition, the newborn babies are it must be controlled, uh, and if the acetabulum is not deep enough, uh, the <clears throat> babies uh, have to uh, wear this public harness when the tie is abducted and flected, and this position uh, can deepen the acetabulum. The next muscle is the tensor fascia latae muscle I want to speak about. This is uh, located a little bit more anteriorly, but this is also an external hip muscle. And um, you can see then, then that the gluteus maximus is mainly posteriorly and it covers partly the gluteus medius muscle. This is uh, on the lateral side and the tensor fascia latae is a little bit more anteriorly. And 
to understand their functions, uh, it can help if you compare these three muscles with the deltoid muscle because uh, they do uh, similar movements than the deltoid. So, for example, if you compare the tensor fascia latte with the anterior part of the deltoid, we have the same movement. So, uh, anterior flexion or flexion in case of the tensor facility together with the medial rotation and a little bit abduction as well uh, can be carried out by these muscles. Then the middle part of the deltoid, which makes the abduction, is very similar to the gluteus medius, which also abducts. And the posterior fibers of the deltoid, which make the retroflexion and external rotation, um, can be compared uh, to the gluteus maximus, which uh, carries out the extension movement and the lateral rotation. And all these three muscles um, insert not only on bone, not only on the femur, but also uh, in the so-called iliotibial tract, that is the thickening of the fascia lata starting from the ilium and going to the lateral head, lateral condyle of the tibia and the head of the fibula. And um, these muscle fibers, the muscle fibers of these three muscles radiate into this fascia. And this fascia is important because it fixes the knee joint, it increases the mechanical resistance of the femur. And it can also cause problems, um, um, for example, in long distance runners, or if um, we have the overuse of uh, this um, tract, the um, this um, tract can be also inflammated uh, due to this repetitive um, uh, rubbing. And um, then you have pain on the lateral side of the knee joint. So uh, in case of this uh, lateral um, uh, pains, very commonly not the not the knee joint, knee joint is affected, but this iliotibia tract. And now let's continue with the deep muscles. Yes, in this picture, you can see um, the first member of this muscle group, the so-called piriformis muscle. And this muscle is also topographically very important. As you can see in the picture, the muscle bisects here the uh, greater sciatic uh, foramen and then the supra and infra piriformis hiatus um, are uh, visible, and you also have to know the structures which pass through this hiatus. And the muscle itself uh, leaves this uh, foramen and inserts on the uh, greater trohanter and uh, has quite a transversal course, so they will carry out the abduction and, and abduction together with, with the lateral rotation. And uh, clinically, uh, it can be important that the sciatic nerve, which normally exists through the infrapiriform hiatus, can uh, be uh, divided much higher. And as you can see in this drawing, the two branches, so the tibial and the common fibular nerve, can uh, also pierce the muscle or can surround the muscle. And in this case, the piriformis syndrome can occur uh, in case of an overuse of the muscle. And then the sciatic nerve can be compressed. And this is also um, quite a painful condition. Uh, in these pictures, you can also see the piriformis muscle here. Uh, and also here, so now is the gluteus maximus here folded up and uh, we are here now under the gluteus medius muscle and under each other you have altogether six muscles. These are also called, that's why deep six, which form the deep muscle group of the hip, starting with the piriformis muscle. 
And under the piriform is the next important muscle is the obturator internus. And as you can see here, it comes from the inner surface of the obturator, obturator membrane and it exists through the lesser uh, sciatic foramen here. And uh, under it, the quadratus femoris is the next one. And um, we have three smaller muscles as well, the two gemellus muscles, which surround the obturator internus muscle. And if you fold up the quadratus femoris, you can find the obturator externus muscle under it, underneath. And all these muscles uh, have a transverse course, if you have a look at this picture, and that's why the, the main function will be the external rotation of the hip joint, as you can see here. Uh, so let's go further to the thigh. Uh, and as I mentioned on the thigh, we have three muscle groups and now you can see the adductors and we have altogether five adductor muscles. So not only uh, those muscles are adductors um, which start with adductor, but we also have the pectineus and the gracilis. Uh, muscles in, in this um, muscle group. And here I want to emphasize that the gracilis spans also the knee joint. So this is the only member which uh, will also move the knee joint. The others act on the hip. And topographically, here we have an, an important opening um, that is called adductor hiatus or tendinous hiatus. It, it is formed by actually by the adductor magnus muscle um, between its muscular and tendinous attachment. And that's the opening where the femoral artery and vein uh, pass through and uh, come into the popliteal fossa. And injuries can be also can also occur. Uh, the so-called riders sprain, for example, in, in riders or in, in case of overstretching of the muscle, for example. And all these adductors are innervated by the obturator nerve. We have only one exception, the pectineus muscle, which is innervated by the femoral nerve. The next muscle group is the extensor group, and that is on the ventral side of the, of the thigh. And the only muscle which uh, can actually extend the knee is the quadriceps femoris. That is this huge muscle with, with four heads. And as you can see in the picture, the, the rectus femoris, so one of the heads originates from the hip bone, that's why uh, this muscle will also act on the hip, it will be a flexor muscle of the hip, and all the other three heads will only act on the knee joint. But the main function is the extension of the knee. And clinically, I want to point out that uh, in children, we usually give the intramuscular injections, not in the gluteus medius, but into the vastus lateralis muscle because in children this muscle is well developed, the gluteus medius is weak. And do not give the injection into the rectus uh, muscle because it uh, tends to shorten after an injection. We have one more member of the extensor group that is the sartorius muscle, the longest muscle of the uh, body actually with this oblique course starting with anterior superior iliac spine and going to the pes anserinus or to the medial side of the tibia but actually the muscle is a flexor muscle of the of the knee uh, joint you can see that uh, with the aid of this muscle we can come into this um, um, sitting position with crossed legs uh, that's why the muscle is called sartorius, uh, Taylor's sitting position um, is visible in this picture. And you can actually see that uh, in the hip we have uh, a flexion and then external rotation and, and in the knee we have a flexion and, 
an internal rotation. But actually, we can live without this muscle. Uh, it can be used for transplantations. The flexor group of the thigh is located on the dorsal side, and uh, it is composed of only three muscles, uh, biceps, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus muscles. And as you can see in these pictures, almost all of them uh, also span the hip joint. So they originate from the ischiac tuberosity, uh, with the exception of the, bice uh, of the short head of the biceps. So they will also uh, act on the hip. But the main function is the flexion of the knee joint. And um, in the knee, we also have rotation movements, and uh, the biceps will carry out a lateral rotation because it inserts on the uh, fibula, so it goes to the lateral side, and the two other muscles will carry out an internal rotation because they um, insert medially. And as I mentioned, they will also act on the hip. And these are the flexor muscles. So this, this is the flex, uh, these are these flexor muscles can also extend the hip like the gluteus maximus. But we usually uh, use these muscles if we uh, if we are walking on a horizontal surface, so not, not uh, in climbing up. And this picture shows what actually happens if these uh, muscles are contracted. In the knee, you can see a flexion and a lateral rotation in this case, so it's done by the biceps femoris, and you can see that the hip joint is extended. Pes anserinus, um, you have heard about, I think, that is this tendinous area found on the medial uh, condyle of the tibia. And um, if we ask it in the exam, students usually know that we have this pes anserinus, by, but uh, very often they do not know where uh, this is located. So it is on the medial um, condyle of the tibia. And as you can see, the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus uh, insert here in this wide tendinous area. And if we fold it up underneath, we have another pesanserinus called deep pesanserinus for the attachment of the semimembranosus muscle. And it, if we translate it, it means whose foot because it has a similar shape. And we also have in hung a Hungarian cake called also like this. You should taste it. And we also have burza here. Um, between the uh, medial condyle of the tibia and the uh, muscle tendons, which uh, can be also inflammated. And we have lots of borza around the knee joint. You have already heard about it. I just only want to summarize the most important borza. For example, the suprapatellar borza. Uh, you have heard about it when you learn the knee joint, it communicates with the knee joint and it can be also inflammated. Or pre-patellar bursa, we also have in front of the patella and um, you can see a condition if, the, if this bursa is inflammated, it can be called housemate's knee. Or the, the infrapatellar bursa, um, can also be inflammated. You can see an example for this condition. Uh, on the, in the popliteal fossa, we can also see, uh, we can also have uh, the protrusion of um, soft tissues. Um, it can be the so-called Baker cyst or popliteal cyst, but this is actually not a bursa but only the protrusion of the synovial layer of the capsule of the knee joint. And uh, this is uh, actually um, a, con a consequence of an inflammatory process of the uh, knee joint. Uh, it's uh, quite common. Uh, and you can see here in these pictures that in this case, then we can see this protrusion uh, in the popliteal fossa. So the muscles we have discussed uh, now uh, act um, 
you know, on the hip joint mainly. Um, and you can see here again that in the hip joint, so this is a free joint, uh, we have um, uh, movements around uh, lots of axes. So practically, if we take the three main axes, uh, we have flexion extension movement around the transverse axis, then abduction adduction around the sagittal axis and rotation movements around the longitudinal axis. So you always have to consider uh, which movements are possible in a joint and then you can uh, think about which muscles can carry out these movements. And as you can see, the different movements can be done by more muscles. And I've always underlined uh, the most important muscles. Uh, so we always have to use it for, for example, for deflection movement. Of and uh, you, you can also see that uh, we have lots of muscles which uh, do the lateral rotation, but uh, uh, not so many can rotate to the medial direction. A split is uh, an interesting movement um, which can be only carried out if the uh, hip joint is bent. Yes, because if you remember the hip joint, we have ligaments in a spiral course and in a, flick, in, in a flected position of the hip joint, the ligaments are loose and only then uh, you can do this maximal abduc abduction or this other uh, type of split <coughs> if we... <coughs> lift our leg uh, like you, as you can see in these pictures it is only um, possible if you make a maximal flexion on one side the other leg is extended so the other leg is not retroflected like uh, here you should maybe uh, think uh, only the, the spinal column um, will uh, correct the posture. So we have the maximal flexion on one side and on the other side extension. And the other joint is the knee joint, which is moved by these muscles. The knee joint is a trochoginglium, so we only have flexion extension and lateral and medial uh, rotation movements. And you can see again which uh, muscles are involved in these movements. And let's continue with the leg. Yes, you can see here um, schematically the cross section of the leg and the muscle groups which are located here. Uh, we have three muscle groups, so extensors are located on the ventral side, but I want to point out that uh, these muscles are actually um, on the lateral side of the tibia because the medial surface of the tibia has a direct contact to the skin. So here we do not have any muscles. Then if you continue it to the lateral direction, on the lateral side of the fibula, we have the fibularis group. And on the dorsal side, we have the flexor group. And this group can be divided into a deep and a superficial uh, group. And what I want to emphasize is that here, these muscle groups are uh, surrounded by a particularly strong fascia called crural fascia, which also um, gives uh, connective tissue septa, which um, um, separate the muscle groups for each other, from each other. Uh, but this fascia is really, really strong and it can cause problems, for example, if you have uh, increased pressure in one of these compartments. Uh, we uh, speak about compartment syndromes. Um, mostly it occurs in the anterior compartment, so in the extensor group. If, for example, due to a trauma or overuse or burns, uh, the muscles get swollen and then um, because the fascia is not flexible, the pressure will increase 
in the compartment and the nerves and vessels will be compressed and it can lead to ischemia and lesion of the muscle. And what you can do is that you have to incise the fascia, as you can see in this picture, picture to prevent the increase of the pressure. And shin splits, that's the mild form of the tibialis anterior syndrome. It's only interesting, not relevant for the exam. So what are these muscle groups? A little bit more in details. In, in the ventral side, we have the extensors. As you can see, three muscles belong to this group. Tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis longus, and extensor digitorum longus. And as you can see, uh, these muscles originate from the bones of the leg and uh, span both the ankle joint and the talotarsal joint, or maybe also the uh, run um, as far as the toes. And the tendons are located on the dorsal surface of the foot. And so they will act in the ankle joint, and the relevant movement is called dorsal flexion. And uh, also in the talotarsal joint, we have movements. Uh, later, I will show uh, another slide, and then there I will explain these movements in details. The next group uh, is the fibularis group or peroneus group. Yes, these two terms are synonyms. Both, both of them are correct. And uh, here, uh, the first picture, so, uh, picture shows the peroneus longus muscle. And as you can see, the um, tendon of the muscle runs behind the lateral malleolus. That, uh, that is um, for all the that's the case for all the fibularis muscles that, that we can find the tendons behind the lateral malleolus. And as you can see, the, these muscles will insert on the sole, the fibularis longus, the tendon of the muscle runs obliquely as far as the first metatarsal bone. And that's why that will be an important muscle in supporting the transfer, transverse plantar arch. And because they insert I show you the next muscle at first. So the peroneal, we have also a peroneus brevis muscle. It inserts also on the sole, but on the uh, fifth metatarsus uh, muscle. And both of them uh, will uh, do the plantar flexion and an eversion movement in the talotarsal joint. And we have a third muscle called peroneus tertius, but this is actually a muscle which uh, corresponds to a tendon coming uh, from the extensor digitorum longus muscle, but this tendon um, inserts on the fifth metatarsal and will, that's why, carry out the same movements as the two other fibularis muscles. Um, and the flexors we have uh, on the leg as well on the dorsal side. And the flexors can be divided into a superficial and a deep group. And now uh, you can see here the superficial group with the triceps suri. So this is actually the only muscle here in this group with three heads. And as you can see, the gastrocnemius heads originate from the femoral condyle. So these heads will also act on the knee joint, they will bend the knee, but the soleus, the third one, inserts, um, originates from the tibia, so they will only act on the foot. So the main function is the plantar flexion, because they are located posteriorly, but they will also supinate. The deep group is underneath. So if you fold up the triceps, you will see these three further muscles, flexor hallucis longus on the lateral side and in the middle, the tibialis posterior, and the, on the medial side, the flexor digitorum longus muscle. Um, but the uh, strongest one is the, the flexor hallucis longus because this is the muscle which uh, we need uh, during uh, walking. And these muscles are 
bipennate or unipennate muscle. So that means the muscle fibers run obliquely to a central tendon or to a peripheral tendon, and that's why these muscles have more muscle power. Uh, clinically, maybe we can mention the tennis leg. Uh, this is um, a condition if we have tears in the mainly in the medial gastrocnemius muscle, it occurs. This triceps tends to overstretch, mm -hmm. and that's why uh, this condition is uh, quite common. And the Achilles tendon is clinically also important. That's the insertion tendon of the triceps uri muscle on the calcanea tuberosity. Uh, and this is the strongest tendon of the body. And um, naturally, we also have bose here between the bone and the tendon, but uh, the most important um, condition here is the if if the tendon ruptures um, this is what you can see in these pictures uh, you won't see any more the tendon if it uh, is torn and uh, for the diagnosis you have to take this uh, so-called Thomson test uh, as you can see in this picture the plantar flexion won't be able anymore and you have to, uh, so it, it must be operated if uh, this tendon is torn. The name of the tendon comes from the Greek mythology. You, I think you know this. And at the end, I have to speak some words about the malleolar regions. Yes, because these muscles can be uh, confused um, in, in the exam, but if you consider behind which malleolus the tendons um, run, it can help a lot. So, for example, now you can see here the medial malleolar region, and as you can see, the tendons run in a, in a, a certain order because uh, the muscle which uh, is located uh, on the leg on the lateral side on the medial side that's the flexor digital muscle will cross the two other muscles to get then into the lateral position so that means that um, on the leg the muscle is located laterally but above the malleolus it crosses at first the tendon of the tibialis posterior muscle. That means that the first tendon will be the tibialis posterior behind the medial malleus. And then we have the flexor digitorum muscle, the tendon of the muscle. And the second crossing is then already on the sole. So here you can see that the flexor digitorum longus will Across the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. So uh, behind the medial malleolus, the most posterior and the deepest tendon at the same time is the flexor hallucis longus muscle. So Tom, Dick, and Harry is the order. And all these muscles will also carry out the supination movement. And the flexor retinaculum uh, is important for uh, compression of, of these tendons, but naturally, if you have, again, an increased pressure, the nerve which runs here, the tibial nerve, uh, will get or it can get compressed, similar to the carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, and behind the lateral malleolus, we have the tendons of the fibularis muscles, uh, yes, so fibularis longus, and then the tendon of fibularis brevis. And they will also do the pronation and together with the plantar flexion. And the tendons of the extensors run toward the dorsal surface of the foot. And that's the last slide. And here I want to speak a little bit about these functions. Um, uh, of these muscles, as I mentioned, they act both on the ankle joint and the talotarsal joint. And if you make schematic drawings like this, you can 
learn the functions a little bit uh, easier. Uh, so, for example, here you can see a cross section of the distal part of the leg with the tibia and the fibula. I also made this schematic drawing for this. And the muscles, uh, you can see the abbreviations of the muscles. So, here tibialis anterior extensor hallucis longus and extensor digitorum longus. So, these are the extensor muscles which are located ventrally. And then posteriorly, you can see the flexor muscles, triceps, and here the deep flexors, and on the lateral side, the fibularis muscles. And if you take the uh, ankle joint, for example, you know that the ankle joint is a, a ganglimus. That means we have only dorsal flexion and plantar flexion around um, transverse axis. Um, but they also act on the talotarsal joint. And if you remember, this is also uh, a joint where, when, where we only have one movement, so eversion and inversion around, um, around an ob oblique axis. Uh, this axis uh, goes from the anterior, um, medial, and upper uh, side laterally, downward, and posteriorly. So this is an oblique axis. Schematically, I also uh, made, made a line for this axis. And if you consider the muscles, so the extensor muscles, um, all these extensor muscles are located in front of the transverse axis, so they will do the dorsal flexion. That's why. But two of them are medially to this oblique axis, so these will be the muscles, so tibialis anterior and extensor halotis longus, which will do the supination movement, so the inversion, if the, that means that the medial border of the uh, foot will be lifted. But the extensor digitorum longus lies already laterally to this axis, so they will do the eversion, the pronation movement. The flexor muscles are located behind the, or the transverse axis, that's why they will do the plantar flexion in the ankle joint, and all of them are medially to this oblique axis, so all of them uh, are involved in the inversion movement again. And the fibularis muscles will also do the plantar flexion because these are located behind, also behind the transverse axis, but they are laterally to this oblique axis. That's why they will do, again, the eversion movement. Okay, so uh, next time we will continue from here. Thank you for your attention.